the American Academy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's presidential lecture entitled, What Do We Need to Do to Achieve a Just Peace? A Conversation, in quotes, in scare quotes, with John Rawls. So it's a great night here at the Academy. Uh, we have three, and eventually we may have four trustees and residents, and I want to welcome Regina Leibinger, Christina Wallich, and Leah Zell, who has flown all the way from the United States. Um, and I also particularly want to welcome uh, Ambassador Vu. Ambas where's the ambassador? Oh, there he is, okay, uh, of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. He, uh, he is their envoy to Germany. We are delighted that you are here. So it is fascinating how, over time, words and their connotations change. And one word in particular that has been transformed in the last few decades is the English word windfall. Uh, if you go to that venerable institution, the Oxford English Dictionary, you can see a graph. This is before they ask you to pay for the subscription service. You can see a graph of how much the usage of the word has increased in the last century. And uh, it has increased dramatically over the last few decades, and my own amateur philology suggests that that change is tracking with the shift in the word's connotation from positive to negative. Um, the positive sense of the word uh, goes back to its origin, which was an unexpe unexpected bit of good luck, and specifically fruit that had fallen from a tree and therefore was available to anyone who wanted it. Uh, the negative, more recent connotation uh, is associated with the phrase windfall profits, which usually means unearned or unjustified profits, often due to hikes in energy prices, due to shortened supply, and that all those windfall profits should be taxed more heavily. Well, I have nothing against taxing windfall profits. I want to make that clear. But I like the older meaning, and I like it particularly now because having Michael Doyle at the Academy has been a windfall for us in the best sense of the word. It was a long introduction. I'm sorry. Michael has been in Berlin on and off since his wife, known to many of you, um, Ambassador Amy Gutman, took up her post here in Berlin. And last spring, he delivered a terrific lecture here at the Academy on his newest book, Cold Peace, Avoiding a New Cold War, and I recommend it to all of you. And afterward, we got to talking, and he said he hoped to spend more time in Berlin, especially this fall. Well, using the staggering powers invested in me as president of the American Academy in Berlin, I asked him if he would like to be a fellow here, and I was thrilled when he answered in the affirmative. And truly, he has been a fabulous addition to our community. He is working hard on his project in, the, in his office in our pavilion outside, designed by our trustee, Regina Leibinger, who's here tonight. Always important to circle back. Um, he is a regular attendee at our events, especially those of his fellow fellows, many of whom are here this evening. Uh, and he is excellent company at lunches and dinners and contributes freely to the um, learned discourse here in the villa. And really, what is not to like? He is a productive fellow, um, and he has another not-too-shabby place to bed down at night at the ambassador's residence, and therefore he never calls at midnight about clogged drains or faulty switches. <laughs> He is also a windfall because Michael Doyle is one of the foremost political scientists at work today in the United States, and I might add, someone I had actually heard of before I came to the Academy, and read, and I had even read him before I came to the Academy. He is University Professor of International Affairs, Political Science, and Law at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, and the co-director of Columbia's Center on Global Governance. He is also the unusual political scientist insofar as he, had had, he has had real experience in international politics, having served as Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor to uh, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan. And in that position, he was responsible for strategic planning, including the Millennium Development Goals, and he also served as chair of the United Nations Democracy Fund. Uh, Michael is a member of the American Philosophical Society as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He, his work 
has uh, garnered a basket full of honors, and in 2009, he received the American Political Science Association's Charles E. Merriam Award, which is given every other year to someone who has published work and and had a career uh, that represent a significant contribution to the art of government through the application of social science research. Michael Doyle is perhaps best known for his path-breaking work on the concept of the democratic peace, and he is using his time at the Academy to revise and expand his magisterial 1997 book, War, Way of War and Peace, Ways of War and Peace, Realism, Liberalism, and Socialism. And one chapter in that work relates to tonight's topic. Now, with truly awful events going on, wars going on in both Ukraine, Gaza, and others threatening to break out any time. This seems exactly like what we should be talking about, especially at a moment when I think we all need to have our values reaffirmed. So Michael will engage with the ghosts of the great political philosopher John Rawls and discuss uh, Rawls's book uh, on international justice, the law of peoples. During this intellectual seance, uh, if you will, Michael will explore what the Rawlsian standards actually are and whether Rawlsian liberal peoples exist. Now, before I hand over the podium, I just want to say a bit of housekeeping. Um, Michael's lecture will last around 30, 40 minutes and will be followed by Q&A. Uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, please type your question in the Q&A part of the platform. Uh, if you're here, just raise your hand and... Um, with that, I turn it over to our distinguished speaker. Thank you very much, Dan. That is a wonderful introduction. Um, it was a, a little large scale. I think the other label that you use for me is a bit more appropriate. Dan frequently says, I'm his day student. Everybody else is a boarder, but I show up here uh, every day commuting in from Dalham, and I'm so pleased to do so. I want to start by basically repeating what every other fellow who's come before me has said, which is to thank this wonderful academy and its staff, and to thank my fellow fellows for making this both so pleasant as a place to stay and so interesting as a place to talk and listen. It's, it's an, uh, an amazing opportunity. Uh, I'll give away another secret. The, uh, uh, the, the internal uh, communications network among the fellows is called the Cushy Fellows, and it's for good reason. This is a wonderful existence. So I want to start by thanking that. As Dan just mentioned, I'm here this semester uh, to revise a book called Ways of War and Peace, published in 1997. And this talk that I'm going to give is going to draw upon conceptions of peace that are in that book. And particularly, it's going to wind up with a discussion of John Rawls, one of the truly great uh, political philosophers of the, of the 20th century. For me, an amazing uh, role model, kind mentor, and teacher in, in so many respects. And so I'm going to have a little bit of a conversation with him. Uh, regretfully, he passed away. Regrettably, he passed away in 2002. So the conversation is a little one-sided, but it goes way back. It goes way back to 1973 when I organized a bi-weekly lunch seminar in our undergraduate house. Leah Zell may have actually attended it once or twice. We go way back. And it then evolved in the 1990s when uh, Rawls contacted me and he wanted to help identify Kazanistans. And I'll describe what that means uh, a little bit into the talk. And we spent a long evening talking in the bar of the Nassau Inn in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, if you've been to the Nassau bar uh, there, you will understand that we, despite its label, had coffee that evening. It's the best brew they serve. And we talked about Kazanistan. So it's in honor of that connection that I want to continue this conversation about the implications of Rawlsian peace for better understanding the circumstances of liberal peace. 
So it's about unjust and just pieces. To many people, all pieces are the same. They're sort of indistinguishable. They're all good, always better than war. Famously in the Churchillian line, jaw, jaw is always better than war, war. He actually never said that. It was said by Macmillan a number of years later when he was imitating Churchill at a lecture he was giving. And it only makes sense if you hear it in a Churchillian imitation, which is jaw, jaw is always better than war, war. And then it does rhyme and it does make some sense. But I want to do something slightly different. I want to draw distinctions between kinds of pieces. I want to talk about unjust pieces, which are peace, okay, better than death, uh, but they're coercive and threatening pieces. And then I want to talk about just pieces, which are voluntary and mutual. On unjust pieces, think of mutually assured destruction. The two sides are at peace only because they're threatening the annihilation of the civilian populations, the populations altogether of both sides. Or balances of power, Machiavelli's idea, and I'll mention that a little bit more, or class conflict, the Marxist idea from the Civil War in France. I'm going to go over that very briefly. Then I want to talk about just pieces. These aren't the only just pieces, but these are two. One is the liberal piece uh, devised by that great uh, uh, philosopher, Immanuel Kant, in 1795. And then I want to talk what Rawls did to build upon and then correct the flaws in the liberal piece that Immanuel Kant described, creating what Rawls argued was a comprehensively just piece that included a new sets of peoples, decent peoples and advanced liberal democracies. So that's my plan. Let's go to the balances of power. They can also produce peace. The basic lesson of Machiavelli and the Prince is you should balance, don't bandwagon. Resist a potential threat, don't join with the threat to exploit other weak states. Do not align with the stronger, he says, for you will be the next victim. You align with the stronger, you defeat the weaker, the stronger then turns on you and you're the next meal. And this is in the Prince chapter one. If we think of conquest as the product of any difference in power between alignments, and peace on the other hand is if power is equal, thus conquest is deterred, some very good political scientists using an arm and a leg worth of assumptions have argued that when we assume a defense-offense ratio of one to one, that is, you can offense or defense based upon the same number of military forces, a military capacity is fixed, fungible, and, and measurable, and there's perfect information, and the states are rapacious, rational, and national egoistic, then you can come up with a stable peace. And the key scholars are Morton Kaplan, Emerson New, Peter Ordeshuk, all, all the last two very good game theorists. There are unstable balances, on the other hand, tripolar is one, I'll get to that in a moment. And then there are stable balances, the great political science, Ken Walt talked about the stability of a bipolar world when two great poles faced off against each other. And what New and Ordeshuk added was how equipoised, balanced alignments, coalitions, could produce peace. And you can see it in this uh, not-so-attractive uh, illustration. Uh, one that's unstable is the tripolar system. If those uh, squares of the same area represent the same power, then there'll be an ongoing incentive for any two to gang up against the third. The third, knowing that, will try to preempt by ganging up on another. They will then go to war and then divide the spoils of the conquered one, whichever one is conquered, and then they'll be in a bipolar system. The other is also balanced and stable. This is a system where the big square, uh, the big power, is in a relationship with two smaller powers, each of which is half of its uh, power weight. This is also stable. The rational incentive of the two smaller is to stay permanently aligned in order to deter the attack by the great power, not to defect from the alliance and join the great power because they know, again, Machiavelli told us centuries ago, they'll be next on the menu. 
So these are both examples of pieces, but they're not, uh, they're not mutual and they're, they're not consensual. Another case of peace is Marxian transnational class conflict and transnational peaceful cooperation. Karl Marx, in a fascinating document, his discussion of the Civil War in France, 1871, described how, in his interpretation, German capitalists were propping up French capitalists both for the purpose of oppressing the French working class. Uh, the citizens of Paris rebelled when the government of Adolf Thiers collaborated, that is, surrendered to uh, Bismarck's successful uh, repelling of Napoleon III's aggression, to put it historically quasi-accurately. And they then rebelled against the French government. And I quote from Marx, Paris armed is the revolution armed. The capitulation of Paris by surrendering to Prussia, not only Paris but all France, initiated the civil war that the Thiers the Republic is now waging, waging against and with the assistance of Prussia against the Republic of Paris. What Bismarck did is that he freed captured French soldiers so they could go back and join the Third Republic for the purpose of repulsing, repelling, conquering the rebelling uh, left uh, parties in the Paris Commune. And I continue, while the European governments thus testify be before Paris, to the international character of class rule, they cry down the international counter-organization of labor against the cosmopolitan conspiracy of capital. So for Marx, you see these peaceful alliances among capitalists, but only for the purpose of crushing the working class in France and in Germany. In a wonderful world to come, the working class will throw off the capitalists and they'll create a, gen a genuine peace. But it hadn't come yet, even though we hoped that in 1871, the first glimmers of it might be appearing in the streets of Paris. So this was the armed conflict. But war also takes place through art. And what you see is a piece of, of post-1871 propaganda art coming from those supporting the Third Republic, retrospectively condemning the rise of the Paris Commune. Uh, I thought I had a pointer, but I don't, so I will step up here. I'm pointing out a few. This is a pastiche of supposed revolutionary events in Paris. And things to observe is the toppling of the obelisk uh, in downtown Paris at the Place Vendôme, the burning of the Tuileries in the top right. These are the horrible crimes, allegedly, actual, but tiltedly, propagandistically, of the commune. Right here you see the Archbishop of Paris. He's being executed by the commune, the soldiers of the commune. And then a very strange grouping right here. These two women, children, holding uh, torches and a bottle, which either is wine, but it may be something else. It may be petrol, because part of the propagandistic charges against the commune is that they failed to discipline, in fact, liberated women who joined the armed rising. And in particular, the supporters of Thiers' government highlighted the pétroleuses. Allegedly, these were women who went around and themselves burned the Tuileries, the Great Palace, burned the Hotel de Ville, burned the, the Palais d'Orsay. So it was this nefarious kind of not quite military, but very destructive action. And the propagandists are putting them right in the center of the picture, you will note. Well, one in particular they had, had in mind was someone who got the nickname of the Red Virgin. Her, her real name was Louise Michel. And here we have a cartoon card that was prepared to uh, denigrate uh, the commune by showing the pétroleuse, the can that she is holding, has pétrole written on it. She is allegedly now burning Paris as one of these revolutionaries, the Red Virgin. The real Louise Michel, by the way, is to the right. That's her. Later on, she had her portrait done in her military uniform. 
She was captured by the Thiers government, put on trial, convicted as a member of the commune. She was. And the most interesting, from the standpoint, I think, of also of, to a certain extent, of feminist history, is that the other element in her prosecution was wearing a military uniform. Uh, none of the men who wore military uniforms were prosecuted on this grounds, but she was. She was convicted. Uh, she was then uh, uh, sent to uh, New Caledonia for 20 years, serving a sentence. She returned back to France. She joined with someone named Prince Kropotkin and founded the anarchist movement. For Americans, she is the Betsy Ross of anarchism. That is, she invented the black flag, which is the symbol of the anarchist movement. She was a brilliant speaker. Kropotkin was a horrible speaker. So she was the favored speaker of the anarchist cause for the rest of her life. She retired in Marseille. And with that wonderful way of the French, the, the Paris government later rehabilitated her historical reputation. And there is now a metro stop called Louise Michel. It's on the Ligne 3 out in Le Valois, so you can stop out there. And if that's not glory, what is having a metro stop <laughs> named after you? So that's the cases of two pieces, but both are very problematic. They're coercive and violent. I'd like to now turn to two pieces that are voluntary and mutually respectable, respectful. The first is the Kantian liberal piece and then Rawls's own piece. The Kantian liberal piece goes back to Immanuel Kant's brilliant essay on perpetual peace published in 1795. It's a hypothetical treaty that he asked uh, uh, potential members of the perpetual peace to sign. And he has three required definitive articles that you have to sign in order to join the peace. And from a social science point of view, this is what explains the peace. One, you have to be a representative republic. You have to have a separation of powers, executive, legislative, judicial, and a representative legislature such that the citizens are represented. And this sets up incentives for peace. Second, you need to sign the Fata Pacificum, the collective security agreement itself, a treaty promising the non-use of force, uh, but avoiding the formation of an international state, which would be very likely tyrannical in his view then. And thirdly and lastly, you have to sign the cosmopolitan law, the third article, which is respect for human beings as persons such that strangers are respected and greeted with hospitality when they show up rather than hostility. And this allows for the possibility of communication and trade. He goes on further in the same essay to explore the quality that's quite important and unique Mostly when we think of international peace, we assume that there's some, the Pope steps in or there's a global monarch or the Martians show up and we all unite. Instead, what, what Kant is arguing is that a peace could be self-enforcing, enforcing from within the units themselves, that is, these republics. And he describes how in perpetual peace. If, he says, as, as is inevitably the case under this constitution, the consent of the citizens is required to decide whether or not war should be declared, it is very natural that they will have a great hesitation in embarking on so dangerous an enterprise, calling down on themselves all the miseries of war. He elaborates fighting, taxes, etc. But under a constitution where the subject is not a citizen, and which is therefore not Republican, it is the simplest thing in the world to go to war. And then he says a bunch of nasty things about monarchs in the rest of the paragraph. That's the logic. There are some virtues that attach to this form of liberal internationalism. It requires liberal republics. Now, in 1795, when he was writing, there were two or maybe at best three quasi-republics the wonderful French Republic of 1791 had already turned into the terror by 1795. Switzerland had some cantons that were quasi-Republican. The U.S. was half slave, half free. So not so great. This was hypothetical in 1795. His sole piece of evidence that he mentions in a letter that he wrote for the feasibility of this is that all of his intellectual friends in Königsberg, you know, just up the way there on the Baltic, 
were so enthused by the French Revolution of 1791, he was sure that all right-thinking peoples would respect fellow republics. Not a lot to go on, but nonetheless enough for him to produce that document. Today, we have more than 100 of republics that we can code. So what are the virtues? One is interstate peace. Two liberal democratic republics are very unlikely to go to war against each other. They're less likely to suffer a civil war, less likely, needless to say, I wish I could say never, to engage in genocide, and much less likely to suffer a distribution-based famine, one of the conclusions of the great economist Amartya Sen. It'd be nice if we could stop with the virtues, but there is another slide, as you can see, and that comes to the pathologies of liberal internationalism. One is unjustified aggression. It takes the form of imprudent hostility toward powerful non-democratic states. And some of these tensions are defensive, but not all. The US-Soviet Cold War had drivers coming from both sides. And it includes a whole list of unjustified aggression against weak non-liberal states, like the U.S. interventions in Iran, Guatemala, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Vietnam, and others. So aggression, unjustified aggressive instincts, is part of the pathology of this uh, otherwise peaceful system among republics. And there's also a failure to assist. That is, there's a failure to support peoples in desperate need of assistance, for example, from famines. Too often these liberal republics, which are pretty good at home, uh, don't extend that same solidarity to other peoples in desperate need around the world. This is where Rawls steps in. Uh, he then develops a wonderful book called The Law of Peoples, which is a follow-on to his book about domestic justice called The Theory of Justice. And this is among liberal democracies. It's an international treaty, a contract agreed to and by and for themselves with eight laws that he thinks they would agree to that would, that would shape together a realistic utopia. The eight, I'm just going to briefly skim through them, that, that peoples are free and independent. Uh, they observe treaties, pactus and servanda. They're equal before in the law. They observe a duty of non-intervention. States will agree to that. They have the right to self-defense, but no right to instigate war for reasons other than self-defense. Peoples will honor human rights. They'll follow international humanitarian law if they engage in war. And eight, peoples have a duty to assist other peoples living under unfavorable conditions that prevent their having a just or decent political and social regime. Rawls thinks that when liberal democracies would get together, this is what they would agree to as the basic framework of rules to govern relations amongst themselves. How realistic it is. Remember he said this is a realistic utopia. The realism, first of all, it's worth noting, and the international lawyers in the room, like, like Anne-Marie over there, I think would agree, this is very modest. This is mostly standard international uh, UN charter law with some international humanitarian law thrown in. So not very demanding. Uh, with a couple exceptions I'll get to in a moment. The piece then rests on Kant's own thesis about the liberal democratic piece. Of course, they'll agree to this and be peaceful among themselves. Most liberal democracies, liberal republics have been, still are. Again, not a big stretch. Uh, but there are a couple things that involve some stretches that are beyond standard liberal internationalism. And the big question is, can uh, roles cure the remaining problems. And the remaining problems are, number one, the absence of equal respect and tolerance for non-liberal peoples that nonetheless respect the most basic human rights. Therefore, military intervention should only be limited to the most egregious violations of human rights, Rawls argues, such as genocide. We, we don't respect non-liberal peoples in the way that a grounding in human rights suggests that one should. That's one problem. 
And another problem is the duty of assistance. We know that these liberal republics, good as they are at home, uh, do not address extreme poverty, famines, and disasters around the world in a way adequate to deal with the problem. So what does he do? In this argument, he first of all thinks that we need to widen the scope of the full-time participants in the law of peoples to what he calls decent hierarchical peoples. He called them Kazanistans in the book, and that's where I came in in 1995. We had a long conversation where we were trying to identify potential Kazanistans. And the reasons he called them Kazanistans is he thought that many of them might be coming out of the world of Middle Eastern culture, Islam, particularly the Gulf. And they're non-aggressive. They respect basic human rights, which and which not. Well, they respect subsistence and basic liberty. No slavery, no serfdom, rule of law, a common good ideal of justice. They have freedom of conscience, thought, property, religious toleration, but they're not liberal polities, and therefore there's not equality of religions. They tolerate other religions, but no equality. Uh, there's no equality of genders, and there's no equal political rights. These are not democracies. Instead, they're hierarchical regimes, but they have consultation. They're not arbitrary dictatorships. They consult. And they consult with groups that are within their society that are represented but not elected. And dissent is tolerated. Leaders respond to arguments. There are a number of examples that one comes across, especially in the Gulf, the traditional consultation mechanisms like the Shura and others. Rawls argued that these decent hierarchical peoples should be tolerated, not pressured to change. They can be criticized. There's free speech, but they shouldn't be coerced to change because they are respectable and worthy of participating in the law of peoples. So what are they? What are the ex actually existing decent hierarchical peoples? Well, uh, with, with, with colleagues, I have gone about using Rawls' criteria to code the most likely states. We look predominantly at hierarchical societies. That's the message. These are decent hierarchical peoples. And we looked at the ones who met his criteria. We found the ones on the left that do meet the criteria, Bhutan, Nepal, Kuwait, Morocco, Jordan, Qatar, Oman. Some that were close, but not quite, the UAE and Bahrain, and a definite no on the Saudi end. And I coded this first with Isan Doramash way back in 2006. And I coded the current lifts with the immense help of Abdullah Al-Haroun. It's very helpful to have a colleague who is fluent in Arabic when you get to these kinds of research. And with both of them, we were able to do this kind of coding. And as you can see, there's some changes. Uh, for example, the, uh, Nepal and Morocco didn't qualify back in 2006. Bhutan, Jordan, and Qatar were partial in 2006. Uh, Bahrain used to be a yes, but is now a partial. So there's some dynamic changes that take place in these countries. But that's our list of states that qualify using Rawls's criteria. This is just a, a picture of what an assessment of Bhutan, a typical country, looks like. So the first thing that Rawls did was uh, extend the zone of toleration and respect to these decent hierarchical peoples. Now, there are other decent peoples that Rawls doesn't discuss. Uh, an interesting work by a colleague here in Germany, Annette Forster, mentions Singapore as a candidate, but it's not a hierarchical society, but it might qualify as decent under the particular Rawlsian categories. So it's not an exhaustive list. This is just the DHPs, the decent hierarchical peoples. Rawls then does another change from the liberal uh, model of Kant, is that he refines, redefines liberal democracies to what we, Abdullah and myself, call advanced liberal democracies. And Rawls argues that to be a real democracy with the capital R uh, in the modern time, you have to have these other characteristics in addition to separation of powers, representative government, some degree of private property, respect for individual liberties. You also need 
a fair equality of opportunity, especially in education and training, free access to education and training beyond the primary and secondary, because this opens up the public to real deliberation rather than truncated deliberation. You need a decent distribution of income so that all can take advantage of the basic freedoms and, and the wealthy do not dominate public life, nor do they create uh, nefarious distinctions between social strata. We need a guarantee that society or government is the employer of last resort. There are very few things that disenfranchise persons than not being able to work when you want to work. You need a society in which if you can't find a job in the private sector, let's put it this way, there's a job that's a real work in the public sector. You need a provision of basic health care for all. Nothing is more disempowering and, uh, and disabling for basic respect than having diseases or illnesses that can't be treated. Um, to the extent they can. And lastly, public funding of elections to provide the information and independence needed for democratic majorities to effectively rule. And so Rawls argues that to be a real democracy, you need to check all of these boxes. Then you have the capacity to genuinely govern yourselves as a democracy. So what are they? Here are the exa actual existing uh, advanced liberal democracies. That are four, there are 14 that are full, that are six that are partial. Um, many of them are North European, as you see, but not all. And all of them, according to our coding, and if you object, we can bring us your objection and we'll go back to the hard data and look once more. But these are the 14 that meet the criteria that Rawls presented. And six that get close but don't quite meet it. This is just a picture of one of the coatings for Finland, for example. So the question is, do, does this make a difference? Do we have improvements on reducing unjustified militarism, on the duty of assistance? And I wrap up by saying that, yes, indeed. Uh, it's hard to measure whether the decent hierarchical peoples are uh, more tolerated. We try to in an article we've done, but we don't succeed, frankly. But what we can say is that there are no wars between decent hierarchical peoples and either liberal democracies or advanced liberal democracies, which is included in the first category. But respect is very hard to measure in diplomacy. There are too few cases, hard to, hard to come up with anything systematic. We can tell a few stories, but nothing beyond that. But I want to note a few elective affinities. This is Germany, which is why I use those terms, that bring things together in ways that are, are, are systematic. One is that on the domestic front, uh, all the ALDs, both the full and the near misses, uh, are characterized by checking off all the boxes, basically, on the global rule of law index. The global rule of in, or law index includes eight factors, including constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, criminal justice. All these are measures, notably, that are different from the measures that Rawls brings to bear for advanced liberal democracies. Nonetheless, 18 of the top 20 on the global rule of law index are the ALDs that we've identified. There's something going on here improving the quality of governance. Remember, different indices in both sets there. And when we turn to the international side, it's noticeable that all of the ALDs are members of the International Criminal Court. Uh, um, uh, only Japan, Denmark, and the Netherlands allowed themselves to be listed among the coalition of the willing supporting the 2003 invasion of Iraq which whatever you think of it was from a legal point of view problematic. Uh, and we note when we look at uh, scores like the average global peace index, 
the ALDs come out as higher. The global peace index is a scale that I normally hate. It has 24 variables all thrown into a garbage can and mixed around of everything from international domestic war, criminality, you make the list. But nonetheless, it has all sorts of things to do with violence. And the ALDs are significantly higher than otherwise rich OECD-style democracies. And on the militarism index, which is the, the military budget divided by the health budget, uh, it's very significantly lower. So again, we have more peaceful societies, these ALDs. And lastly, what about the duty of assistance? Are they better at helping countries in desperation? This is only one indicator. This is uh, uh, OECD development assistance, the, uh, the DAC measure. Uh, only the ALDs are countries in green, dark or light green. Only ALDs meet the 0.7 global target of, G of, GN of uh, national income. And as you see, ALDs, absolutely predominate at the more generous end of the spectrum. Uh, this is something that leans strongly in that direction. So here's where I want to stop. Uh, my conclusion is that the more a democracy looks like a Rawlsian advanced liberal democracy, the more likely it is to be peaceful and meet the duty of assistance that Rawls says is part of one's ethical duty as a member of the law of peoples. But I, I see some social scientists in the room, and I'm looking at Andy right now. Uh, this is not a proof uh, of, the, uh, of this proposition. It's barely a plausibility probe. That is, there's no experimental evidence. There's no quasi-experimental evidence. This is not a multivariate model. There are no instrumental variables. Instead, it's just identifying some tentative associations that should make us, in my opinion, want to take the Rawlsian argument from a empirical policy, uh, real world point of view, much more seriously than it has been, and provide us with something of an ideal that might be worth struggling for. It wouldn't be such a bad world if we began to respect those decent hierarchical, hierarchical peoples, and an even better world if we all became advanced liberal democracies. That's where I'll stop. Thank you. I welcome your comments or questions. Okay, I'm convinced. Um, but I do have maybe one uh, opening set of questions, which is there's one notable country that thinks of itself as an advanced liberal democracy that wasn't on the list. And uh, I can think of plenty of reasons why it's not on the list, but why don't you tell me why it's not on the list? It happens to be in the name of our institution. Okay. Yeah. You're not talking about the entire <laughs> continent right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> We're talking about our country. Yes. You know, look, look, it's a wonderful country. We are the yeah. products of it. What can, I, what can we say? It just was nowhere even close. And, um, you know, the problems are well, that... We, we're, we're, we are advanced and liberal enough that we're prepared to air our dirty laundry in public. So. Yes, we're very good when it comes... So you know, relatively good when it comes to freedom of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of enterprise, we're very good at. But when it comes to providing the tools that all of our people need in terms of education, not enough. When it comes to health care, our distribution of income, public funding of elections, the U.S. doesn't come close on most of those measures. And for Rawls, as you heard, I'm, I'm somewhat persuaded of it. These five things really do help make a democracy more functioning. That is, putting not only formally but substantively the government more, more in the hands of, of citizens. And that's why it doesn't show up on the list. Okay, so that was... Um that was the soft left leading up to the hard right, okay. um, which is, I think, what a lot of Americans, including um, lots of liberals who would share your aspirations for the country, would say is, well, we're spending so much time and money um, 
preserving peace around the world, mm -hmm. that we haven't devoted the resources at home that we should. Mm -hmm. Some people would say that's a good thing. Some people would say it's a bad thing. And so, you know, the question about the democratic peace becomes in a world in which, you know, lots of countries are not aspiring to become mm -hmm. ALDSs, as sure. we now uh, use in that jargon, although it sounds somewhat suspicious. Mm -hmm. uh, AL, um, you know, aren't, are some countries condemned to, um, you know, not be on the right track because they're so busy deploying aircraft carriers around the world to prevent worse things from happening. Yeah, I think there is something to that argument. Uh, that is, you know, one of the reasons that uh, some European countries could invest much more in education, the arts, uh, uh, fair treatment of workers, workers' education, like is, which is done so wonderfully here in this country, is that uh, some of their defense needs were being covered by the United States historically. That's changing very rapidly today, as we all know. Uh, but there are some truth to that. Know. Plenty, of, plenty are still complaining. But okay, but it's, it looks like it's yeah. headed in that direction. Correct. But for a lot of history, there was something to that. I, I would certainly agree. Um, I would think that, again, I'm channeling uh, Rawls, that, you know, he was a sensible guy. He believed in realistic utopias, that the world would be sort of like that. But he would argue that the United States is not overtaxed. When it comes to April the 15th, I'm not sure I would be on his side, but I, I pay. And the historical trend is such that the U.S. is uh, undertaxed, uh, given our needs, our domestic needs especially, maybe even increasingly some international needs. And so we're, we're not stepping up to the plate. And uh, so he would agree with the first half that of, your, of your observation, that there are countries that have benefited from U.S. defense protection allowing them to be better at home. Uh, but the, that's not an excuse for the United States not to be better at home, I think, given the plan. I guess, and this will be my last question, we'll open up to the crowd because I'm sure they'll have more interesting and informed questions. But the, um, my point, I guess, is more one of process, which is how do you get to the democratic peace in a world where you have lots of countries that aren't either... ALDSs or DHPs, mm -hmm. um, but are in fact big S's, spoilers. Yeah. Um, and um, do, do you and, and Mr. Rawls have a view of how you get there when you have such a unequal division of roles and responsibilities in the international community? I mean, this is, this is deeper into the weeds of international security policy than he ever went. Uh, he was this great mind of understanding the interaction of basic principles. So I'm only speculating. But I think he would, given his the realism part of his utopia, would not be unsympathetic to the view that the world is a dangerous place and that there are strong incentives for the democracies <coughs> Uh, to align, to protect themselves. Um, and to do that may require uh, some difficult compromises. Well, not all democracies are all the same. They have different agendas. And not all states are democracies, but some of them will be very important to given, to given alliances. And that needs to be taken into account if you're going to establish the kind of security balancing it against the most dangerous uh, rogue states, call them that, uh, that are out there. So he would, you know, he was a relatively reasonable guy and uh, supporting a robust but necessary defense would be something he would support. Yeah. What he opposed was rampant interventionism and uh, undue uh, Cold War blustering, which he thought was just a waste of both energy and responsible security. So I love the phrase realistic utopia. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to make it kind of our motto, you know, a realistic utopia under, mm -hmm. the, under the sign. Um, I have plenty more questions. I want to open it up. I think there's a tablet coming my way too. But uh, why don't we start back there where that hand is up? I can't see the face that goes with it, but okay, go ahead. 
Yeah, just um, yeah, just use the mic. Yeah, Susan Neiman, um, uh, director of the Einstein Forum, and like you, Michael, I had the good fortune to be a student of Rawls, both mm. as an undergraduate and uh, he was also my doctor Fata, a word he never would have used, but actually he was a sort of Fata in the best sense of the mm. word. Um, couple of things about your talk that I found very interesting. Um, one is, of course, um, it can't be a proof in the social science sense because it was very clear to him that he was being normative. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, and, and doing ideal theory, although uh, some of us wished sometimes he'd been just a little less ideal or talked more about that. But your work, as you showed it tonight, is very much in his own sense of showing that the utopia is realistic. Mm -hmm. um, he once told me um, when I was working on the problem of evil that his idea of a realistic utopia was his answer to the problem of evil. So he certainly knew about the dangers and, and the evils in the world. My question goes back to the intervention question, which you quite mm. rightly put up. That is, I don't think that um, all of the energy and money that's being spent on the military is only a matter of keeping the peace. It's also a matter of what uh, Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex and warned us against. Mm. And I wonder if you have an idea either from your you know, your own non roles work or um, other work, um, what he might have said. So in the 80s, he was actually planning to rewrite theory of justice to respond to Marxist critics. Mm -hmm. That became not a serious project after 91. But it was something he was quite interested in. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you ever spoke to him about how to deal with the problems of, say, a military-industrial complex um, within a capitalist framework. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I, I hear two, two points. One is on interventions, and then the other is on the military-industrial complex. Uh, we didn't discuss the second in the various occasions that I had to meet with him. I was, I was never one of his formal students, my wife was, but I, 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 I was not because I'm a card-carrying empirical political scientist, uh, different end of the intellectual spectrum, inspired by Rawls, but not a philosopher in, in any sense of the term. But I, but I would not be surprised if he viewed, as did Eisenhower, the military-industrial complex as a major threat to American democracy. And I think he would have hoped, I think he would have hoped that the kind of reforms that he described, those five principles, would serve to curb the undue influence of uh, that kind of a uh, presence in American democracy. We did discuss interventions on a, on a number of occasions. And he felt that there were way too many interventions, that they were driven by by Cold War fantasies, by corporate interest, by political interest of governments that happened to be in power, and they had caused immense uh, harm. Uh, the Vietnam War was only one of them, and it was right in the middle, of course, of his teaching career. And so he decided that this was something that he would speak strongly against, as he does in the Eight Law of Peoples, no intervention. But he did acknowledge that there'd be extreme cases of where intervention was morally necessary. He was so reluctant to talk about it that he left it in a footnote. It's footnote, I don't know, 93, page 57. I remember talking to him about it a couple times. And he says, well, when should you intervene? And he said it should always be something to be done only in the utmost necessity. And so we talked, and I said, well, why don't you put an example down? And that's when we stopped talking. As you know, he wrote this book at the very end of his life. He was in very poor health. He once told me that he wrote The Theory of Justice seven times. Uh, that is, it was rewritten.
to be just what he wanted to say. This book was taken out of his hands as he was dying, and it was edited by somebody in the press, and you can see the loose ends. But nonetheless, he did put in an example I saw when the book was eventually showed up in my hands. And he tried to think of what would be the extreme case. And the extreme case, it reflects how extreme he wanted it to make, would be something like the Aztecs. I have no idea whether he did any research on the Aztecs. But he meant a, uh, a community that was exploiting its own people to such an extreme degree that it was even consuming captives, including their own young. I have no idea. Uh, Jorge could probably tell me if he's, if he's here whether this has any grounding in fact. But it, the purpose of it was to make intervention as rare as possible. He wanted something close to cannibalism before he was beginning willing to talk about a military intervention. And that comes to your point. He was afraid of interventions because the principle of self-determination was really a core value to him. It shows up again and again. It shows up with his basic presupposition that we live in a world of states, not a world that's a global polity. Well, it sort of begs the question about how he felt about intervention to prevent genocide. Well, genocide, this was his, his notion of what a genocide would uh -huh. be, okay. something close to cannibalism. Yes, you're next. Thank you. Rick Ginkur, uh, business lawyer and banking lawyer, uh, come from a different field, but the question would be related to your uh, slide with those graphics that I find, find a little bit um, astonishing. What would your take be uh, with regard to today's world? What could the, today's new world order look like, uh, given those pictures that you have, uh, have shown us, as to whether or not there will be potentially, as it's a little bit loose at least, indicating already that perhaps Russia, China, Iran seem to merge into whatever corporation or whatever you name it, uh, military alliance, perhaps forward-looking, and on the other hand, perhaps the United States and NATO alliance, and perhaps forward-looking given the coordination uh, between the United States, North, uh, South Korea, sorry, and Japan, which would probably be uh, subsequently advanced for forward-looking for the Southeast Asian countries as well, uh, perhaps in, including uh, India as well, having in mind the Quad uh, uh, talks that are ongoing. Is this potentially, given this graphic that you have shown us, a dynamic process simply given by nature, like a cancer-like development, just looking for, like Machiavelli said, for a balance of power in the end? Yeah, um, you know, as I put those, those graphs up there, I wanted to emphasize the arm and a leg worth of assumptions you need to come up with those as the logically required result. And they are extreme. So when we get to the real world, it gets more complicated. It gets sometimes a little better. Offense-defense ratios are almost never one-to-one. -one. Uh, the tradition is three-to-one, which gives an off advantage to the defense, which might stabilize, but that creates uncertainty, okay? So the, the more fundamental thing about getting closer to our real world is that we live in a world where, where capacities and power are differentiating. You know, militarily at the very highest levels, the world is bipolar. It's Russia and the United States when it comes to nuclear weapons. Economically, the world is also bipolar, the US and China, unless the Europeans fully integrate, then it becomes tripolar. So the world is getting multidimensional. The basic division line that's increasingly emerging is between you know, Russia and China on the one hand, and the US and its allies in, in, of course, Western Europe through NATO, increasingly moving to East Asia with the Quad and other associated states. So the world is bifurcating into alliance systems. But it's hard to say if they're equal. Uh, they're not radically unequal when you put Russia with China and the US and Western Europe. Uh, you've got uh, something like uh, balancing of, of, of bilaterally, not radically dissimilar alliances, though most of the advantages are still with the West uh, on this model. But the basic message is that power is now multidimensional. And so the very simple little squares that I could draw assuming 15 things uh, you can't do in the real world. We need a much more textured analysis. About over here, to go to the other side of the room. 
good evening, Katja Gardner. Um, I remember a talk of Edward Seid um, from about 25 years ago mm -hmm. uh, on just peace. Mm -hmm. And he used the word uh, identity very often and shared I identity. Mm -hmm. I, I missed that tonight mm -hmm. and I think it's important to mm -hmm. have something in common before we sit down at the negotiation table and um, I want to know when you talk about justice do you talk about um, the person with a sword or you talk about the lady with a scale Okay, thank you both. Identity is, I think, is very important. Uh, Edward Said had a special notion of it, but in general, identity is very important. Fortunately, the diplomatic community itself becomes a core, uh, a group that acquires identities and commitments toward problem solving. And that can sometimes bridge otherwise very different political systems, very different ideologies, and produce pragmatic, good diplomatic solutions. Another source of identity is in these philosophers who stress it in different ways. Uh, you know, for, for Marx, he, he felt that unfortunately, the French capital regime and the German capital regime had more in common than they had with the French working class or the German working class. He was exaggerating historically, we know, but that was his concern about identity. And he hoped that someday when the working class itself achieved revolutionary dominance, the common understanding across the world of all being workers, having a common identity of that, would itself produce a global peace. Hasn't yet happened. Uh, for the liberals, there's a common identity built up in that third principle of Kant, the cosmopolitan law, that all individuals across the world are worthy of basic respect. They all need to be treated as ends, not means. And that's an underlying normative identity that is part of the most respectable thrust of the liberal argument. The difficulty arises in real politics when, even when one has that common identity, all human beings count as one and are deserving respect. What if they're being ruled by governments that don't treat them at home uh, from the standpoint of respect? And that's where we get some of the big ideological differences emerging between democracies and non-democracies. The democracies think the people govern, they look at another state and they say, no, some elite or a dictator governs. And therefore, the identity which exists among peoples don't get, doesn't get reflected in policy. So those dimensions, I think, are very important. And the only, really, only real kind of, of, of just justice is the scales. Uh, the justice of the sword, Hobbes or others, that's the justice of the balance of power, the balance of terror, where it's only terror that prevents a war, not respect and not common understanding, not, not identity. Ambassador, you had a question. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to ask question. Please use the microphone so that the whole world hears it. Yeah, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, have a question to my teacher. Actually, I'm here not um, as ambassador at first, but at first I am a student of Professor Michael Doing. 30 years ago, I was in his class in Princeton. So today, you know, all the phone memories uh, come back again. Thank you very much. And um, I just remember that um, you were uh, assistant secretary Chairman of the UN. And um, Vietnam remains grateful for your support to have Vietnam to be involved in peacekeeping operations. Um, you know, it's wonderful now that we can contribute, can give back to the UN community um, by contributing our troops in our services. My question is, you know, um, how do you think about the role of the UN in ensuring just peace? You talk only about individual countries and powers, but I think the UN and its institutions have been doing very, very much in this regard. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. It's wonderful to be a teacher and uh, pretend as if you can take any credit for such an extraordinary diplomat and such an important career. 
uh, what, what you've done and what you do for your country in achieving the genuine independence, uh, not just formal legal independence, but the real independence of Vietnam is something that I can just admire. Um, the UN, it's, it's always been a mixed bag. I'm a huge supporter for obvious reasons of it. One of the great uh, benefits, one of the great, you know, most inspiring moments of my career was working for Kofi Annan. It was only a few years, but that was something that I'll always treasure. He represented the very best of that institution and what it could become. But it, it, was, it was always a struggle. Uh, the, the, the UN is an institution um, that, that wasn't designed to get us to heaven. It was designed to keep us out of hell. It reflects all of those compromises. It is the child of a very um, um, hard-hitting, exploitative understanding amongst uh, uh, Stalin, uh, Churchill to protect the empire, uh, Roosevelt, a great person to create a whole new world, uh, Chiang Kai-shek holding on to uh, China, France, the UK, imperial powers. They designed the institution with some feedback from some idealistic Australians and Latin Americans. Uh, and so you get a Security Council that looks like a European uh, Vienna Convention Committee of the, of, the, of the big powers and a General Assembly where everybody gets no vote. The first has legal authority, the second makes recommendations. And so it's, it's, a, it's a product very much of its times that nonetheless elevates its vision through some of its commitments, most importantly human rights, most importantly trying to reduce the threat of the scourge of war and solve uh, ongoing disputes through peacemaking and peacekeeping. But its, its feet are very deep in the mud, even though its vision is looking for the clouds. So it's always going to be a, a problematic institution. Professor Moravchik. Um, I've appropriated so many arguments from Michael Doyle over the years that I'm really hoping this one's right so I can appropriate it as well. Um, <clears throat> and to figure out whether we should appropriate it or apply it, I wanted to ask you a little more how you're thinking theoretically about what causes these super democratic, super Pacific countries to be what they are and act as they are. Because mm. it seems to me... You could make an argument that's strictly causal. You could say this is like a super kind of Kantian mm -hmm. representativeness that makes it impossible to impose this, the, the, the rigors of war on your own population. Mm -hmm. But you could also argue that it, it is a correlation, it's important, but it's not causal. Mm -hmm. It's caused by something else that's causing countries to be both super democratic and mm -hmm. super pacific. Right. And two obvious examples that political scientists have studied that might do this. Um, one would be social democratic ideology um, and the sense that people are ideationally prone to both create certain kind of governments and behave certain ways. Mm -hmm. And another one is ethnic or cultural homogeneity, at least in the founding moments of a state, which is said by some to make it easier for them to to cooperate domestically, but also would give them less reason to have a gripe with other countries. And I'm sure there are mm -hmm. a zillion others that you've thought of. So I'm wondering yeah. what you think the causal model is that mm. actually means that this correlation exists. Yeah. Good question. I, I knew that there was a social scientist lurking in that corner, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm confirmed in my judgment. Those are excellent questions. You know, and, and if I were 50 or 40, or even, or even 30, I might think that I could invest all that time and energy it would take to sort all of that out. That's why I described that all I'm doing here is the first cut at these questions. But the next cut at those questions, I think, would address exactly your concerns. And that is that we would add in other variables other than my domestic um, ideology and domestic institution variable. Uh, in order to compare their weight in exploring the range of outcomes that we would define. 
You know, amongst them, of course, is NATO protection for the Europeans. How weighty a factor is that in explaining what's happening? Amongst them are things like, uh, you know, they're all wealthy, but then we would say, are there other wealthy countries that don't fit it? But nonetheless, the wealthiness is going to be a factor in all of this. On social democratic ideology, I would push back a little bit on that and say that's indigenous. You know, those five things that I just described from Rawls, it's sort of social democratic ideology that he's talking about there. He's talking about that solidarity that comes from equal citizenship and the sense that one is not just a cog in some market economy, but has an identity as a citizen that overrides one's economic function or an identity as a worker that defines a role as a citizen. Again, tapping into social democratic ideology. Ethnic cleansing, you know, eth that was the wrong phrase, ethnic homogeneity, uh, definitely as a factor. You know, it, we know, unfortunately, historically, that on, this, on the identity question, uh, it takes uh, a, a really democratic, democratic citizen to look beyond some of the quasi-primordial associations. And if you don't have to, it's a little easier on the politics of it to then get people to pay the taxes and, and allow for regulation and invest in young people. And so for the Swedens of this world, at the time of their social democratic founding, or, or the Finlands, or we could go down the list of many of these countries, that would be a factor. And they're now all being tested. Sweden, like Germany, is a country of immigration in quite significant numbers, and like the Netherlands, and like others, and we can see the strains. The election in the Netherlands last a few days ago reflected some of those strains. So it'll be more difficult as well as going forward. So in the ideal world, I'll, I'll uh, inspire a few colleagues more to work with me and we'll do that kind of a multivariate testing that you rightly identify as the real way to probe causal significance. But for now, I just want to say that Rawls had identified something that plausibly connects to these outcomes, and there are some degrees of affinities that we can observe that seem to affirm them. And the, my end conclusion was that the more you had those Rawlsian categories, the higher you scored on both the dimensions of peace and the duty of assistance. And for me, that's enough to do the next set of work that you rightly identify, which is to go do the hard work and trying to get some what we call multiple variable causal explanations pushed up against each other to see which one is doing the most work. And I'm absolutely certain that it won't just come out to be one. It's just, that would be so unusual and ridiculous, it ain't gonna happen. And some of the factors you describe, I think, will push in that direction. So I have a follow-up question, which is in some ways for you, erudite uh, social scientist, a vulgar one, but you know, Martin Luther King famously said that the arc, um, arc of history bends towards justice. And I'm thinking of that on the one hand, which suggests that the, you know, if we wait long enough, we'll get the democratic peace. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm also thinking about that number you had on one of your slides, which was something like 100 countries mm -hmm. which were headed in this direction. So mm -hmm. I would probe you a little bit on that. We're in a period of serious democratic backsliding. A lot of countries that were considered uh, to be in the category of democracies mm -hmm. have fallen out. I mean, I always think of Mali, which was the longest... <laughs> running democracy in sub-Saharan Africa, and then mm. suddenly it was gone. And so mm. I suppose the question I have is we have a global kind of de democratic recession is, mm -hmm. you know, how confident are you that this is all going to, the train's going to keep going in the same direction? Yeah. No, it's a very hard question. On the 100, I coded 100, let's call them ordinary liberal republics uh, as of a few years ago. Uh, that means that there are 90-some countries that are not, okay? And the numbers have been going down uh, from the last time I did a coding, which is about 10 or 15 years ago now. And we are, as you actually described, in a, in, in a democratic recession. And that has to be you know, problematic for all of us. Uh, because for many years, after World War II, uh, we saw the 
the, the graph is going the right way. And it's now going sort of like this. And that has to raise people's questions about, is the underlying hope, that is, that as people um, satisfy their survival needs, uh, you know, the Maslow hierarchy, they then begin to demand other needs about participation and identity and become f good subjects for democracy. Is that being changed? And the problem is that we know in the past that it wasn't always a steady slope. You know, all we need to do is go back to the 1920s. We saw Italian democracy collapse in 1924. We saw German democracy. We saw the Japanese Republic collapse in 1929 to 31. There was a period when we saw, when we saw the U.S. democracy straining, you know, with the Father Coughlin's and the others running around where it could have gone that way too. And so we can't assume a steady path. During times of history, things like depressions put extreme strain on democratic governance. So do wars. Um, and so this is a serious problem. We can't just assume it's going to go that way. It, it's a struggle, uh, a daily struggle, to, to make the difference. I just noticed, I, looked at, I was looking at some data on Mali. Mali is the steepest decline in freedom scores yet measured. Yeah you know, over the past few years. It's a, it is enormous what's happened in that unfortunate country. This is not new, though. And so here's the only good news that comes from this. When Immanuel Kant was thinking about the same problem, he warned that uh, this would not be steady progress. It would be inherently uncertain. Uh, but, he said, while you could expect waves like this, the overall slope over time would go up. And if we go from the three that I could identify in 1795, the 100 plus today is a big step forward. Uh, and we don't yet have, a, are not yet in the position that we're in the 1930s. We're sort of in the 20s in terms of some of the changes that are taking place. And it's something we should worry about, but not despair, is, is my bottom line. I'll code you as a realistic optimist. <laughs> okay. Professor Slaughter. I, Thank you. <clears throat> yes, this is a, a, actually a corner of Michael Doyle uh, admirers, so I also was Michael Doyle's student uh, and very proud of it. Um, and Michael, you are a, a card-carrying empiricist, but you are also one who can have a conversation with Rawls and take Kant very seriously, and when you bring the two together... Uh, you know, your work has had enormous impact, not only in the academy, but also on on public policy. I mean, when you wrote the Democratic piece, those original articles, and then your book in the 80s, I think your first article is 83, that directly influenced Tony Lake and Bill Clinton's strategy of democratic enlargement, right? There was a the policy debates that Dan and I were in, uh, I think often distorted your work for the purposes of making, in other words, took the nuance out of it, let's say mm -hmm. that. But it really did, you know, people really argued about whether if we enlarge the democratic sphere, would that give us a more, a more peaceful world? And I, I so I, I'm imagining some of those debates, and I'm imagining some of the folks on the other side of those debates who, who I fear will read this and say, you know, you've gone from liberal democracies don't fight one another. And again, I know it was much more nuanced than that, but that was the way it was read to, and I, when you said, the more a democracy looks like a Rawlsian advanced liberal democracy, the more likely it is to be peaceful and meet the duty of assistance. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, what, do, what are you going to say when people say, boy, he has really retreated from the original claim? Okay, that's a very reasonable question, thank you. Uh, I, I would respond, I'm not retreating. That is that the United States' and the non-advanced liberal democracies are still going to maintain peace with other liberal republics. That's, I see no reason to ex see strong grounds to walk away from that reasonable hypothesis. What I wanted to say further, and this builds upon that, is that these advanced liberal democracies we can call them social democracies for that term, uh, actually do better. 
That is that they have taken some of the unjustified militarism out of the liberal democracies and some of the failures to meet the duty of assistance and actually step closer to the kind of responsibilities we need. So my reaction would be, I hope it's inspiring. I hope it says to people that the 14 ALDs that I identify, keep up the good work, don't backslide, okay? You know, keep up those standards because it pays off, not just for yourself, which is the most important reason, but in terms of better world order. And for others, it's uh, one additional reason to move in that direction. The real reason, of course, is domestic. It's treating your own citizens as genuine uh, equals deserving of our respect and investment. That's what it's basically asking. So I see that it builds upon it. But, you know, like all policy debates, I'm, I'm aware of some of these the issues that you talked about. They're, they seem quite natural. There was a group of people on the other side who were arguing, no, you know, the, the Doyle line is much too pessimistic. What we really know is that democracies are inherently peaceful. All you need is a democracy and you get peace. And that, unfortunately, leads into people saying, well, if we invade Iraq and turn it into a democracy, isn't that a good idea? <laughs> and so there's, there are faults that come from uh, academic uh, musings that one has to be careful, careful with. And I think we always have to be aware of it. One is delighted to sometimes hear uh, that people in power actually read what an academic scribbler had to say, but you don't want to take any credit for it because you'll very soon get the blame. So <laughs> you're better off just staying in the ivory tower in that regard, in, in my opinion. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. I'm gonna go to this side of the room right now, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Heiko Günther. Uh, the ideas about the just uh, peace always interact with the idea about the just war. Mm -hmm. uh, was there in John Rawls thinking any idea about the just war or about even uh, measures below the war? I mean like military assistance or sanctions which you impose on other countries? Um, because pacifist movement or part of the pacifist movements would say like uh, to achieve peace we just must stop any um, for exa uh, example military assistance to uh, Ukraine or, and then we will achieve a peace. Is there anything uh, about this in John Rawls thinking? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, he did give some thought to the question of just war but frankly, it's completely derivative uh, in a good sense because he was deriving it from a very powerful book by a friend and colleague of his, Michael Waltzer, who wrote a wonderful book called Just and Unjust Wars. And as you could see from the title of this talk today, I was sort of borrowing from that with the distinctions that I was drawing about pieces. But he borrowed the idea that there is such a thing as a just war you know, a just war is a defensive war. It's a war where you're defending the right of your political community to continued self-determination. And Rawls agreed uh, with Walzer that those were the circumstances that justified a war. As I mentioned elsewhere, under the most extreme, and he is extreme of the extreme, he could envision a humanitarian in in intervention against a genocide or something like that. But by, by, by the rest of his argument, the key thing is that if you're in a war, and it's a just war, it's a just war, but in order to stay a just war, it has to be fought justly. That is, it has to be fought according to the principles of international humanitarian law, making sure that you discriminate between non-combatants and combatants, use force only that's necessary, don't use force if other means are capable of achieving your ends. All of these traditional criteria are ones that Rawls fully adopted. And in his book, he drew the conclusion, therefore, uh, that while some uh, bombing of cities might have been justified at that single point in history where it looked like 
you know, Hitler and the Japanese Empire were about to take over the whole world. At no other part of the war, including the times of the war, when most of the mass bombing of cities took place, was it justified? It was a violation of the basic principles of non-combatant protection. And so he strongly condemns the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the bombings of cities in Europe that took place during World War II. So the just war is very much a part, but it's very heavily building upon Michael Walzer's great book, Just and Unjust Wars. It's, you know, by and large, a summary of some of Michael's arguments with which John Rawls was strongly agreeing. He might have gone beyond them, but he did not. Others have suggested that he take into account the harmful effects of things like sanctions, for example, which can have impacts that are not unlike kinetic force, uh, when, especially when they're misused and not targeted in ways that are justified. So that would be something that he would look into strongly. When it came to military assistance, he would ask, you know, what's it for? If it's to help another country defend itself so that it's defending its own self-determination, the right of its own people to make up their own lives, he would regard that as good. If it's assisting some country to invade another country or insisting, assisting the government to oppress its own people, that kind of military assistance would obviously be bad. Last question, quickly, and a quick answer. Thank you. Wait for the mic. Thanks. Uh, so I was very interested in unpacking a bit more the duty to assist in the international refugee regime. Mm -hmm. uh, so Rawls tells us in A Theory of Justice that you are all potential refugees and that refugees are ordinary people in exceptional circumstances. So I wanted to know more if you found any interesting findings in your study between the behavior of uh, advanced liberal democracies and refugee responsibility sharing, specifically geographical uh, responsibility sharing. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I'm very interested in the questions of migration and, and refugee protection. Uh, there's two or three sentences in the Law of Peoples, but it's not informative on the question of immigration. He, was sa he just said the countries will have to negotiate reasonable regimes. But refugees who were fleeing uh, from persecution from the 51 Convention, and he would broaden it to save their lives, Kant's own protection under the cosmopolitan law, deserve protection. But he said nothing more than that and didn't go beyond it. Whether it makes a positive difference is a really interesting question. Uh, and the, the record on refugee protection, as, as you may know, is very diverse. A number of countries that domestically uh, would not be described as either certainly not described as advanced liberal democracies, actually are ex exceptionally generous in treating people who come across their borders. You know, think of Pakistan, think of Turkey. They, they host numbers of refugees that dwarf the numbers, both in absolute and percentage terms, dwarfed by the advanced liberal democracies. So it, it would need to be carefully investigated um, given the particular circumstances, whether there are any differences between the advanced liberal democracies and other democracies, but it would have to be investigated in the context of remarkable acts of generosity by countries like Pakistan, Turkey, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Colombia, uh, for a while, Ecuador, uh, that house large numbers of people, even though they themselves are by and large not wealthy, and are not driven by the same factors I described elsewhere. So a complicated but interesting story. Okay, well, Michael Doyle, thank you for a fascinating talk. And I'm glad that there's a research agenda for your next fellowship <laughs> at the American <laughs> Academy Thanks. in Berlin. I, I think you owe me like seven or eight years worth of fellowship. These questions were pretty tough. Well, we can talk. Um, okay. <laughs> And you can bring that Rawls guy. He sounds really interesting, too. Um, okay. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, I do want to thank the audience for a lot of terrific uh, questions tonight. Um, about our next events, uh, Thursday we will have our Maria Kellen 
Anna Maria Kellenfellow, Sarah Mohammed will explore the human rights of soldiers um, and uh, look at the question of whether service members are more than cannon fodder. Um, next week, uh, Stuart Kirsch will elaborate on his topic of counting carbon, uh, which will be in the Mercedes-Benz lecture on December 4th. And the day after that, Tuesday, 5th, or Tuesday the 5th, we will have a p public panel discussion uh, on governing AI, who can, who should, and to what end. I think all of those will be really interesting. Uh, they will be in person and online and start at 7.30 p.m. Central European time. So... Uh, either uh, sign up to watch or sign up to come visit. And uh, thank you so much for an enlightening evening. Thank you. Thank you.